If you can't tell by the very distinct way that I'm dressed for today's episode, we've got a slightly different subject matter, uh, and I'm going to use this show as a chance to wax poetical about one of my favorite things ever, my favorite band ever, uh, and a cocktail that I made inspired by their music. Defrutum, grape must, wine fermentation, and coheed and cambria on today's episode of Mike's Hard Reviews. Wow, that's quite the list. <laughs> Hey there, hi there, ho there. My name is Michael. I am a bartender and a home mixologist from Kalamazoo, Michigan. And today uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about uh, my favorite band ever, Coheed and Cambria, and a cocktail that I call One Among the Fence that was inspired uh, by their music and lineage and the influence that they've had on me as a person. You know, tacky as that may be to some of you, um, I don't care. <laughs> it's my favorite, one of my favorite things ever. So Now, there is actually also a sort of experimental ethos behind all of this, and we'll discuss that first, but there's going to be a pretty short short front end of this video and then a pretty heavy back end to this video. So if you want to, you can just simply skip to the making of, you know, me making this cocktail. There's a video chapter down there and I'll, I'll walk you through everything. But a lot of this is just going to be for my own personal, I wanted to talk about this, so I'm going to talk about it kind of thing. There's an experimental ethos here and that is in the notion of the flavor of grape. Um, I was thinking about it, and have been for a while actually, that there's not very many cocktails that are flavored like grape, the way that there are popsicles or juices or different other things like jellies and jams and preserves and things of those natures. Cocktails get kind of passed over. There's not very many of them that even include grape as a primary but a predominant flavor. There's like a purple people eater and then technically the Anzoni has grapes in it, but it's not the same as like purple grapes. It's green grapes, which are a different thing. The actual flavor of grape is not like embraced, you know, dominantly in any particular cocktail, and I wanted to do that. So I went down this rabbit hole of trying to figure out how other people did them, and I was reminded, of all things, by uh, by uh, Max from Tasting History, uh, that there is an ingredient that has stretched centuries of time, um, that has made, you know, had a mainstay even today, uh, as an ingredient that is, is exactly what I'm looking for. That ingredient is a grape reduction syrup known as Defrutum, which I have some of in this bottle right here. Defrutum is technically a reduction of what is called grape must. That is a juice made from the maceration of grapes that contains their peels, their seeds, their fruit, their juice, everything about them holistically. Before wine is fermented, most of those things are removed to prevent bitter flavors or off components that are hard to control. Uh, and that same thing goes for defrutum. This, rather than being fermented, is reduced down into a syrup that is actually quite preservative on its own, based on its own sugar quantity. Uh, and is then, at least back in the day, was used to sweeten wines. Uh, and in the modern day, uh, in places like Iran, Iraq, uh, Italy, Greece, is used as, as a sort of dessert condiment, kind of how Americans use maple syrup for breakfast foods. This is really fascinating stuff um, that is actually quite difficult to make on your own. So um, let me kind of break down my process here. I went to the store, I bought two packages of table grapes. I blended them together without any water so that their natural juices would be the vast majority of the content in the pitcher, and then attempted to strain out all of the fruit mass. There's not very much juice in certain kinds of grapes, which makes them kind of difficult to produce a juice out of that way. So what I was really dealing with was, for the most part, a uh, sieve filled with grape parts uh, and a very, very small amount of freshly made grape juice at the bottom that would not reduce correctly. I did end up using what I had to make a very, very small reduction, uh, and it was amazing. Uh, there's a lot of tartaric and malic acid in uh, grapes, which is distinct from the citric acid in citrus. So it has this kind of lively tart sharpness to it that hits you differently than citrus does, and is very, very three-dimensional while still tasting like grapes, but sort of, because it's concentrated, sort of emboldened grapes. The problem is that it's so effort and time and cost intensive if you're not you know, a wine manufacturer, and you're dealing with, you know, end user prices, um, 
I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. That said though, I also wouldn't necessarily recommend you go out and buy something like this off of the shelf. The problem with grape must is that it's also one of the primary flavors or rather the preceding steps of making balsamic vinegar. And while it is entirely possible to find, I'm sure, reduction-based grape syrups like Defrutum online, a lot of what you're gonna find is actually something meant to mimic balsamic vinegar, which is what I ended up finding by accident in this, uh, Siniti Saba. Now the bottle simply says cooked grape must, and I thought that, that meant it was just a reduction of grape must, like what I was looking for. And I guess technically it is, but it's also been modified and played with in certain ways to simply taste a lot like balsamic vinegar. It's not bad, and it might work at a cocktail, but it's certainly not what I was looking for. If anything, it tastes more like raisins than it does grapes, and that's it's not what we're going for here, and it also makes the drink look really ugly. This is like a not not like a nice purple magenta color. This is brown. It just looks kind of purple from where you're sitting. <laughs> the best course is to go ahead and make your own, and the best option that I found was to take readily made grape juice, you know, ideally 100% grape juice, of whatever varietal you prefer, and then reduce that for about an hour on the stove. I went to a a local like nicer food store. I found 100% grape juice on the shelf. Grabbed that and just did the reduction using that. It was very, very simple. You could, in theory, uh, use something like Monin or Tarani, uh, grape-flavored syrup, but, but the difference you're gonna get is that that is uh, the syrup-making process, which is additive. And in that case, it's probably artificial as well. So you're getting sugar added to something rather than the water removed from it. And that's not going to concentrate flavor as well, and it's going to leave you with artificial notes you do not want. If you can, spend the effort, reduce some grape juice, you'll have a great thing that lasts for like a year, if not indefinitely, in the fridge if you do it right. So that's our experimental ethos, trying to make a grape flavored cocktail. And now let's go ahead and actually do that by making a one among the fence right now. So the one among the fence is a shaken cocktail and we're gonna grab our Boston here. To begin, I'm gonna go ahead and throw in a single dash of Peychaud's bitters. I'll follow that up with three quarters of an ounce of our defrutum or reduced uh, grape must. If you don't have the time or for whatever reason, you have the access to something you can reduce properly, you can, I would say, substitute this with one ounce of a, you know, store-ready grape, an off-the-shelf grape juice. Um, you won't get the same kind of complexity or depth of the flavor, but it will get the point across and sort of emulate it the way that you would want it to. Next up, we're gonna do one third of an ounce of creme de violet. This is a violet flavored liqueur. A little bit goes a long way. Um, anything more than a third of an ounce will make the drink both too sweet and uh, too floral. We're gonna come in behind that with some freshly squeezed lime juice. And then now we need our base, which I chose to go with uh, two different spirits. We're gonna use um, a blended rum I'm using two ports today, which is a Jamaican and a Dominican, both unaged. And some Novo, uh, Novo Fogo unaged cachaça, which we're going to do one ounce of. I actually really like the way that Novo Fogo and the sort of metallic funkiness of um, cachaça in general plays with the flavor of grape. If you wanted to, going up to two ounces and cachaça is fine. If you're not a fan of that particular kind of funkiness, going up to two ounces of rum is also fine. Um, I think so long as you are using a rum adjacent spirit here and you're blending it a little bit to give it a little bit of extra dimension, you're gonna find that these flavors work really, really well with the sort of smooth sugar character you get from that kind of spirit. We're gonna go ahead and add some ice. Like always, I'm going to maintain our one cube hole and one cube cracked ethos. And then we'll cap that up, tap that down and give that a shake for 10 to 12 seconds to combine. For our glassware, I'm gonna grab, uh, grab, I'm gonna grab a double, uh, double rocks glass here. I'm gonna fill that up with some uh, smaller, but not, you know, down to pebble cube ice. Grab our cocktail shaker here. This one is one of my older ones, so it seals up a little tight. <laughs> grab a cocktail strainer and strain that over our ice. To finish this off, we're gonna go ahead and make our garnish here. I'm gonna take this leftover piece of lime and just do a nice little lime wheel. We'll push that down alongside the ice. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a one among the fence. Alrighty, with our station cleaned up, let's go ahead and give our one among the fence a taste. Cheers. Man, that is so pleasant and vibrant and fun and tart and refreshing 
Interesting. Oh my god. The vast majority of the flavor is absolutely the defrutum in there. That sort of three-dimensional grape flavor is loud and bright and very much in your face, backed up by this sort of sharp citric acid from the lime that's keeping it from becoming too syrupy or like saccharinely sweet. At the same time, that creme de violet is giving it this additional dimension of uh, floralness that is sort of adjacent to that grape flavor in the first place. I've always kind of found that creme de violet is like sort of berry-like in the way that it is sweet. So it complements both the lime and the grape very, very well here. And in tandem with that extra little bit of herbal complexity that we threw in with that dash of Peychaud's bitters, it's sort of combining to be this this, this grape flavor that is very specifically like those grape push pops you can get, those otter pops, if they're called, I think, um, that you can get at the store as you have when you were a kid. It's very, very much like that. There's a sort of light, uh, funky Jamaican impact going on here and a smoothness from the Dominican, uh, both, you know, both those parts of that two ports of rum and this kind of nice metallic funkiness from the cachaça that is very, very, you know, prevalent, but not overwhelming. It's very well moderated here, which I think is kind of a problem for a lot of people who aren't used to cachaça. It's very loud and very kind of abrasive in certain ways, which is expected, you know, for somebody who's not used to a new, a new spirit. Uh, but here, it's, it is more than welcome. It is creating a flavor synthesis that is unique, but still welcoming and warm, not warming necessarily, I guess, but <sighs> invigorating. You know, very, it feels like an old friend in a way, which is exactly what I wanted to go for when I decided to base a cocktail off of this band. So at this point, this is the end of the video for all of those of you who don't want to know jack shit about my favorite band and don't give a fuck about my my preferences for music. Uh, but if you wanted to stick around, you can. we're going to talk about um, my favorite band ever, Coheed and Cambria, whose merch I am currently decked out in. <laughs> Queen Cambria begins as a band called Toxic Parents, which breaks up, but still contains uh, Claudio Sanchez and Travis Stever. Uh, the two two of the four people who currently make up Coheed and Cambria. They get together with uh, a drummer whose name I think is Van Kelly and a bass player named, I think, J Joe Corleone, I think? Uh, and they form a band called Beautiful Loser, um, which is kind of hilarious because I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if that's where this comes from. It says Beautiful Losers. <laughs> uh, Beautiful Loser does not survive very long. Apparently there was an argument over gas money, of all things, and that led to the band breaking up. Uh, and becoming a trio that was then renamed to Shibuti in 1995. That is the beginning roots of what would become Coheed and Cambria. Now that name Shibuti is really interesting. It comes from a movie called The Naked Prey, where the term Shibuti is an African chant uh, used eponymously that means naked prey. Uh, Shibuti would go on to make music between 1995 and 1996, uh, experimenting with their overall sound and expanding across multiple different genres, including pop, punk, alt-rock, and even funk, which I thought was fascinating. In 1996, their, ba uh, their bass player leaves, uh, 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 John Corleone, or Corleo, Joe Corleo, Corleone, I can't remember his name for the life of me. Leaves the band and then is replaced by uh, bass player Mike Todd, who was originally a guitar player but picked up bass specifically to play in Shibuti. He would later become a consistent member of Coheed and Cambria as well. Between that time and 1999, Shibuti records and releases a series of studio demos, uh, including the Penelope EP and begins to develop a pretty considerable following for a band as small as they were at the time. Uh, eventually, in 1999, the drummer Van Kelly leaves is then ultimately replaced by Josh Epert, who is the current drummer for Coheed and Cambria, and at that time, Travis Stever rejoins the band, and you have the lineup for most of its history of Coheed and Cambria. Now, it's not until 1998, though, that they start to go by that name. Shibuti exists as its own independent thing prior to the formation of what we know as Coheed and Cambria today. You see, the band uh, goes on a trip uh, to France in 1998, and while they're there, frontman Claudio Sanchez develops a story, a series of stories, uh, based on the uh, one of the EPs of Shibuti called Delirium Trigger. These stories are called The Bag Online Adventures, and eventually they get renamed to The Armory Wars. And this becomes the sort of conceptual backbone of all of the music that the band would go on to produce. The band talks about it, they collectively agree to rename themselves to Coheed and Cambria uh, after the two main protagonists of the series that Claudio is working on, and all of their music becomes conceptually focused on what those stories are trying to tell. At the same time, they also develop their uh, new sort of 
insignia for the band called the Keywork, which is a representation of how the planets are aligned in the world of the Amory Wars. Or I guess the Bag Online Adventures at this time. In any case, uh, they go on to sort of cement this idea that they are going to be a conceptual rock band with their first album release in 2002 of the Second Stage Turbine Blade, which was met with reasonably positive results, and as a result led to them touring with other bands who were bigger at the time, like Linkin Park, The Used, and Slipknot. They would then go on to release two of their most popular albums, uh, In Keeping Secrets of Silent Earth 3 and Good Apollo, I'm Burning Star 4, Volume 1, Fear Through the Eyes of Madness. Yes, that is the entire title of that album. It is so, so long. <laughs> In uh, 2003 and 2005, respectively. That second one, uh, Good Apollo, is their best-selling album to date. In between the two of those albums, they will be skyrocketed to prog rock fame as they begin to develop this conceptual idea behind their music and the sound that they carry with them as a result. So we would go on to produce uh, up to date uh, 10 different studio album releases, nine of which are conceptual, one of which is not, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. They are to this day still producing the same weird and unique uh, sounding and unique purposed music that you're not going to find almost anywhere else. Now, I think what's really crazy about this is that this is 30 years ago now that this band started, and they're still around, just almost to some extent at least, in their original form, still making weird and odd music. And that's especially fascinating when you consider that uh, a little while ago, there was kind of talks that they might not survive. Uh, in 2006, uh, both Josh Epert and uh, Mike Todd, the drummer and bass player for Coheed and Cambria, left the band. Both of them were dealing with very severe addictions to heroin, uh, and they both needed to seek help. Initially, Josh's departure from the band was, you know, played away as um, creative differences or a, a lack of creativity, um, but he clarified that almost immediately in interviews and said, no, I had a drug problem. Uh, Mike Todd admitted it straight up and went straight into rehab. I, I mean, and this was a big issue. There are, there are documentaries that talk about this time in the band's, uh, in the band's life cycle where they're on tour and they're trying to go play shows all around the world, and that's exacerbating these issues these two members of the band are having, and it means that when they leave, they've got to have their drum and bass techs fill in for them for a couple of shows, and ultimately find very, very fast replacements for them that who knows if they're gonna stick. <laughs> Josh is replaced by uh, Chris Penny, who's the drummer for another band uh, whose name I can't recall, and Mike Todd is replaced at that time, I think by a, a series of uh, stand-in bass players, including their own bass tech and I think a couple people from other bands who were sort of guest starring. Ike rejoins the band in 2007 and Josh, at the time, declares a permanent departure and begins to work on a side project called Weird Science, which I believe to this day is still uh, an active project for him, even if it is working more slowly than Coheed. And I mean, this reflects a very, you know, different time in their music, when people often kind of think that they're st starting to kind of struggle with their sound and, and continuing to evolve. Um, and I think that a lot of people who listen to their music would think the albums from this time, um, Year of the Black Rainbow and No World for Tomorrow, um, are kind of lackluster in comparison to the varied and, and very cohesive sound, yet still cohesive sound of their previous albums. But in the end, um, both, both band members left for a time, and it reflected in the way that they had to carry themselves. Things would again change in 2011, when Mike Todd is arrested for robbing a Walgreens while on tour with the band. He was still struggling with his addiction at the time, and ultimately it led him to make some mistakes, and he pled guilty. Uh, at that time, the band released a statement uh, where the two of them, you know, the band and Mike, had agreed to go their separate ways permanently, and ultimately led to Mike not being a part of Coheed and Cambria anymore. Um, he still produces his own, as far as I'm aware, still produces his own side project, um, but is now also dealing with an unfortunate cancer diagnosis. So um, to you, Mike, I sincerely hope things are going better now, um, and I wish you uh, hopeful and speedy recovery. Mike goes on to be replaced by a, a bass player named Zach Cooper, who's from another band, I think from the Nyack, New York area that the band originates from. Um, and he is still the current bass player for Coheed and Cambria and likely will be for the remainder of the band's existence. At the same time though, Chris Penny, who had replaced Josh Epert originally back in 2006, is actually leaving the band. Uh, actually, this time for real, <laughs> related to creative differences between the band and him, and is replaced once again by Josh Epert, who has remained the drummer for uh, Coheed and Cambria um, since. Which is amazing, because 
uh, there are discussions of uh, his, you know, struggle with addiction and touring and, you know, being around the band, the people who associate with the band, in a documentary called The Physics of Color, which was released with their album Color Before the Sun, uh, Colors Before the Sun, in 2015, and he, Josh talks about some of that and what that was like, and it's really great to see that he's managed to overcome those demons and kind of, you know, bring himself back into this thing that he was in love with, and and to continue to share that with the rest you know, the rest of the world. You know, despite all those struggles, Coheed has managed to exist for over 30 years, <laughs> well, I guess not over, but around 30 years now. And they've been making music that entire time that has been unique and varied and continues to evolve. Um, sort of the beginning of the band is kind of this very, you know, new age, new metal, punk influence notion that develops into prog rock by their third album, Good Apollo, and nowadays has started to move towards the involvement of additional electronic components. I believe it was in 2008 they actually picked up a backup vocalist and keyboard player for touring shows because some of the music that they were working on was starting to include these sort of electronic MIDI piano scores and, and background notions that added contextual complexity to the music. And that has ma maintained a mainstay for this entire time. Their most recent release, uh, Vax's Act 2, um, no, no Window for the Waking Mind, is a very electronic heavy album, and in a very positive and unique and kind of constructive way. Not in the way you would think of like club music, but in the way you would think of as like abstract ambient music, um, yet still maintaining all of those same rhythms and melodies you find in really, really, really good rock music that it kind of defies genre. I mean, Coheed has taken influence from so many different facets of the musical world and made them their own around this concept that is the Omri Wars comics that their frontman writes, that they've become kind of their own unique and awesome and weird thing. Which is at this point where I'm gonna stop the history and, and tell you exactly why I wanted to make this cocktail from the, their inspiration. I am 24 years old, by no means old. But I've been around for a minute, uh, and for almost all of that time, in one way or another, uh, since I've you know started listening to music at probably like age seven, um, I I've been listening to Coheed's music. My brother was a huge fan of their work. He has a signed poster uh, from the release of I, th I think um, in Keeping Secrets of Silent Earth that has all four of the band member signatures on it at that time. So Josh, Mike, Travis, and Claudio, and uh, I nearly stole it from him when he moved. Um, you ever see this, Corey? Sorry. I didn't. I didn't steal it from you, but I thought about it. <laughs> They've been a really important part of my engagement with music um, and my inspiration to learn how to play music. Um, I play guitar, uh, and I, you know, uh, my inspiration for that was among other bands like Rise Against and um, uh, Avenged Sevenfold, and um, eventually later on, I the Mighty, Fuck you, Brett Walsh, but I miss I the Mighty. <laughs> you know, they were a big inspiration in in wanting me to, you know, my wanting to pursue music. And I think it kind of boils down to um, the way that they carry themselves. Coheed is a very inclusive band. They, they have <laughs> outright stated, hey, if you're a bigot or a racist or uh, a loser of any kind of any similar sort, stay the fuck away from our shows. Look up Coheed and Cambria controversy, that's what comes up. The flack they caught from ignorant assholes on the internet uh, for telling them that they didn't want ignorant assholes from the internet to be at their shows. They're a lovely group of people who not only care about the people who listen to their music uh, and the actual act of making that music, but what that music means for people. I've seen Coheed multiple times. The first time was in 2015 at the Royal Oak Music Theater on their tour for Colors Before the Sun. Uh, the second time was in 2018 on the Unheavenly Creatures tour at DTE Music Theater in Detroit. Uh, and this most recent time, I drove out to Madison with my roommate um, to go see them play at the Sylvie alongside Death Heaven. There's a very, very particular thing that Claudio said um, in the interim, I think, you know, halfway through or towards the end of their, their last part of their set. Something akin to the notion of, thank you all so much for letting us be here, coming from everywhere in this world, and for all this time letting us be weird and crazy and make this music for us. And that that statement, combined with a line from the song 
Comatose off of uh, their most recent album that goes, um, go sing a song for all your lonely hearts made me realize that Coheed has been so important to me because it's music for outsiders. Um, I didn't grow up particularly popular. I didn't grow up particularly affluent. I didn't grow up particularly cared for. You know, people have it a lot worse than I do, but I grew up feeling kind of alone. And for me, Coheed and Cambria's music has been everything about myself that I wanted to embrace, all the weird eccentris you know, eccentrisms that I wished I could be myself. Um, and they've been this sort of safety blanket for me in knowing that there are people in this world who are, you know, capable of being themselves and can be comfortable in doing so, and a reminder to me that I could do the same thing myself. They make music for weirdos and outcasts and losers. Uh, in fact, beautiful losers. And uh, I love them every second for that. Um, they stand by what they mean, they fight for what is good, and they give the biggest of fucks about the people who listen to their music and what they think. And I feel like that's becoming more and more these days a lost art. Maybe that makes you sound like an old man, but um, truthfully, I think Cody and Cambria is one of very few bands left that is so, so dedicated to their art and their fans that I, especially with my history with their music, could not in good conscience at some point come up with a drink that I could raise to them and say thank you for the nearly 20 years of my life that you have given me inspiration and comfort and music to headbang to. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure if I was gonna tell this story, but I might as well. Um, I was at the sleep and I was standing in the crowd and I was having a raucous good time. And my roommate taps me on the shoulder and she goes, the people behind us just got, just got engaged. And I think it was to the song, um, I think No Way Back, uh, I think the subtitle was True Pavilion, I think. Um, that are Beautiful Losers, I can't remember. But I remember being surrounded by these people who are screaming these lyrics that have resonated with my heart and soul for over t nearly 20 years of my life. Um, and being so in the moment and so happy and seeing this beautiful moment happen in this community that I am a very very, very proud member of that I thought, this is my lifelong band. This is the, this is the band that I am <laughs> never going to stop listen, listening to. And that can't be said for, you know, other, other groups. It's, it's amazing. The community with this band is phenomenal. Um, and I am every day thankful for the fact that I'm getting to experience it and growing ever more sad that I know that one day it will inevitably end. But until that happens, uh, raise a toast and, uh, you know, good eye, sniper. I'll shoot you run. If you know, you know. <laughs> so, um, that's all I had for this episode. Um, hopefully you guys don't mind me nerding out about my weird, uh, hyper fixations in music, uh, too much. Um, I, uh, I'm actually not going to close out this episode with, um, a reading from Crisp Toast, so we're going to do something different instead. So I'm going to say thank you for watching it if you enjoyed. Click the like button down below and subscribe to catch the next episode. Make a new episode every single Friday uh, and sometimes on Tuesdays, so click that bell notification to know when those happen. And you can follow me on my socials that are either appearing on the screen or have been on the screen and are fading away. I don't know. The pacing for this video is definitely going to be weirder than other ones, so. <laughs> and uh, with that, I'm going to leave you guys not with a reading from Crisp Toast, uh, but with a cover that I will be singing and performing of Never Ender from Coheed and Cambria's first album, The Second Stage Sure by the Blade. Uh, thanks for watching. Enjoy. I guess here goes nothing. <laughs>
time you would never regret In savoring sleep What do you mean? Night sauce and turn everywhere I'll miss you when you're gone But pretending that you hurt the world to me When he's out on his own When the hand is 7.30 And the night begins to sink And the short, the faster fall And the night just put a calm retort to a mirror that frames your face Wearing the finest swell When the day begins to break Like the tears that run across your cheek You're scraping imagine well And the things in the way they could have been And the thoughts that race across your chin Here in the never ends Mistakes. Dear mom and dad, I'll write you in this letter that says I'm moving on. A new day's begun. Forget your son when he's out on his own. YouTube channel and I just did that. <laughs>